Okay, so here's a fun little sea critter. Can you guess what it is? Maybe some type of coral, jellyfish? Maybe it's not an animal at all. Not to spoil the fun guessing game, but it's none of those things. In fact, this branching, fleshy bush is actually a crustacean. Yes, a, a crustacean. Why don't I show you just how bizarre it is? Parasites are gross. They enter into a symbiotic relationship with their host against its will and suck it dry of its life essence. However, studying them can help us to better understand biology and how such bizarre lifestyles can evolve in the first place. Parasites come in three major flavors. Ectoparasites live on the outside of their host's body. Endoparasites live on the inside. Mesoparasites are an in-between that partially enters the body, usually a flap or something, and embeds itself there. Below these major lifestyles, there are six major evolutionary strategies these three parasite types employ. Parasitic castration, in which the parasite castrates the host. Directly transmitted parasitism, in which parasites go from host to host when hosts touch, such as lice. Trophically transmitted parasites, which are the parasites that get in their host by being consumed. Vector transmitted parasites, which need a host to carry them from one host to another as a direct part of their life cycle. Parasitoidism, which are critters that end up killing their host but live most of their lives free of being a parasite. And finally, micropredation, which are critters that attack their host for sustenance and then leave the host, such as mosquitoes. As I have traversed the brutal and diabolical world of parasites, I have covered some of these parasite types. However, one of the weirdest on a body modification level has got to be the internal parasites of starfish. I'm sure you're aware of barnacles. Maybe not so much on what they are, but somewhat more on what they look like and in what context one might find them. Barnacles are those marine, crusty, shelly, eye-like things that cover rocks, reefs, boats, and big animals. Most are just sessile suspension feeders that adhere themselves to basically anything and then stick out their tentacles anytime they get the munchies. Only one family of theirs is a parasite, the rhizocephala, which ironically parasitizes crustaceans. It's ironic because barnacles, despite their looks, are actually a type of crustacean as well. Barnacles are all kinds of weird, but they have some cousins that blow this weirdness out of the seawater. The sister group to the barnacles is the Ascothoracida. This large subclass contains two major groups. One is called the Lorida and contains ecto, meso, and endoparasites of Nidarians, which includes corals and jellyfish, with one genus parasitizing the remaining living members of the Crinoidea, or feather stars. These guys are super weird, but are relatively difficult to talk about because most of the literature on them is behind a paywall and there are but a few images. However, from what I have found, they are the more primitive of the two groups. Loridan adult forms look like the larval forms of their weirder cousins I'm gonna get to here in a second. The Loridans actually look a little bit like the ancient bivalved arthropods of the Cambrian period, or I suppose any of the numerous tiny shelled arthropods that swim in the water column like ostracods and ichthyostracans. These representatives of the Synagoga genus look like little brains or veined cowrie shells. Anyways, enough stalling. Let's get into the actually weirdest crustacean you've ever seen, the Dendrogastridians. The sister group to the Loridans is the Dendrogastrida. These critters took a completely different route when they adapted to parasitize the already incredibly bizarre echinoderms, the starfish, brittle stars, and sea urchins. Study of these most unusual of animals is very niche, so information about them is a little harder to collect. Before we move into the biology of the Dendrogastrida, let's take a brief tour of the Echinoderm. Echinoderms are marine animals that evolved from bilaterally symmetric ancestors, which means they were like us, with two halves of the body. The majority of them have what is called radial symmetry, which means they are symmetrical in a circle with chunks of threes, fives, etc. They have matching sections that meet at a central point, but cannot be cut in half and have identical halves. 
They also don't have a skeleton like us. Instead, they have an interlocking system of calcite plates on the inside of their bodies beneath the skin. They also have an incredibly weird system to move themselves without the use of muscular power, which I was taught was called a hydrostatic skeleton and you can sometimes still see it labeled like that. I don't even know for sure if that term is largely considered inaccurate, but from everything I am seeing in my research, it seems the term water vascular system TM. is actually more accurate. The water vascular system is basically a huge pipe system that runs through the body of echinoderms that is filled with water. Let's zero in on starfish since they are the most common host for the parasites we are here to learn about. In starfish, the water fills in the feet the animal uses to crawl around on. When the muscles contract, water is forced into the two feet and the whole thing fills out like a balloon. When the muscle relaxes, the water is sucked out and back into the bulb connected to the foot and the foot itself shrinks back down. The internal fluid-filled sacs that make up the structural support of these animals is a perfect living space for any enterprising parasites to fill up. The Dendrogastrida is an order of three families. The Ascothoracidae, Tenoscolidae, and Dendrogastridae. The majority of these things have adapted to be endoparasites of starfish. Relatively little is known of these animals because they live inside the body cavities of starfish, which means observing them requires indiscriminately carving up every starfish you see. The best known genus is Dendrogaster of the Dendrogastridae family, so most of what I say about these animals comes from this genus meaning there will undoubtedly be many exceptions and differences between families. It seems as though no one has yet been able to directly observe the metamorphosis from the larval stage of these animals into the adult stage. But before I get ahead of myself, why don't we go through both the anatomy and life cycle as we know it. Dendrogastridans generally have three life stages. They start out as an egg laid by the female, hatch into a nauplius stage, and then metamorphose into the adult stage whenever and however they find a host and insert themselves. All that is known is that once they find a host, they burrow into the body until they can find the fluid-filled inner body cavity or coelom. The larvae or nauplius of the dendrogastridans tend to be terribly similar to the larval and adult stages of their loridan cousins in that they are carapaced, floating, seed-like, shrimpy things that float in the water column as plankton. A nauplius stage is the larval stage of many aquatic arthropods, characterized by three head segments, a carapace, and an unsegmented posterior body that is often a tail-like organ. Each segment tends to have a pair of appendages and the things kind of just scoot around looking for food to get bigger and shed their skin so they can reach the stage at which they metamorphose into whatever adult stage they have. Once the nauplius stage is over and they have become adults, these animals tend to be strongly sexually dimorphic. The adult female has shucked off basically every characteristic trait of arthropods in order to fit inside the starfish and absorb as many nutrients from the host as possible. As you can see, the giant female has evolved to resemble the gonads of the starfish, being a central column or blobbish structure of flesh and tendons and a bunch of branching limbs or body segments that branch further and further into other limbs. This is why the eponymous genus got the name Dendrogaster, which is made of the roots dendro meaning tree and gaster meaning stomach. The adults lost their eyes, for they have no need to see the horrors they wrought upon the insides of the poor starfish. Their mouth parts are vestigial or almost vestigial in most forms as they have no need to actually manipulate food. Instead, they absorb nutrients directly from the body cavity or coelom of their host, though some do still retain a teeny weeny mouth to slurp juices. Unlike many other arthropods of the water, they have no filamentous appendages to speak of. Hell, what would they need swimmy bits for? Like any good eldritch parasite, the adult male pushes things too far. He lives inside the host with the adult female underneath her mantle or carapace and sometimes inside her brood chamber. The only thing he really lives for is to reproduce, so why have any extemporaneous anatomy? The male is often just a head segment and a long thin protruding gonad segment. It's not entirely different from what many anglerfish do. 
Once inside the starfish, many biologists think they very slowly kill or weaken their host by stealing nutrients or just replace the gonads of the host so that it can no longer reproduce but keeping it alive. They just keep pumping out eggs and noplii to go and infect other hapless starfish. Interestingly, these animals seem to be both globally distributed and distributed throughout the water column. They can be found as deep as 2,500 meters or as shallow as the intertidal zone. There are around 35 known species of the Dendrogaster genus slurping up the roomy insides of 18 families of stars, with many other genera within the Dendrogastridae family plus the other Dendrogastridin families doing the same thing across the world's oceans. Anywhere there is a star to menace, you will find a stomach tree parasite doing just that. Before I let you go, let me tell you about a study published in 2023 by a huge team of Japanese researchers. They described three new species of the Dendrogaster genus parasitizing starfish that had only been named a few years prior. Aside from describing the new guys, the researchers also studied their DNA, which showed that there was a large split in the genus thousands to millions of years ago. Some stayed in shallower depths, while others stuck to deeper waters. Was this because they specialized in hosts that preferred different depths, or were these parasites just carried to various depths by different depth-preferring hosts? Based on their analysis, they found that it was more likely the parasites adapted to prefer different hosts, rather than just going along for the ride and co-evolving with their hosts. Sometimes you're just a simple insect sucking blood from a giant killer animal, and other times your entire species gets entangled amongst the insides of an animal. Hey, at least it's pretty much free food and a place to stay and mate for your entire life. Couldn't be an easier life out there for an animal. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.